I'm Ben Ross. I'm Shoot Kapow. And I'm Skeletroy. And you're listening to Very Good Music, a VGM podcast. Once again, you are listening to episode 7 of season 4 of Very Good Music. And as I mentioned last week, I am joined once again by my good buddy and favorite theme song guy, Skeletroy. Hello. In addition to uh, my my regular co-host and favorite oldest child, Shoot Kapow. <laughs> Yay, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, and we are going to be talking about... Uh, one of our favorite composers, uh, Naoki Kodaka, who is very special to both myself and Skeletroy. And uh, Shukapau, uh, you have a little bit of experience with Kodaka's work as well, don't you? Um, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the only track that you recommended for the superhero episode, episode, episode that I did with Prof. Jeff was... Oh yeah, that was um, uh, the Batman NES, right? Yep, NES Batman, uh, Stage 1, or Streets of Desolation, yes, which is a stone-cold classic. And what are some other uh, soundtracks that you that you know of from Naoki Kodaka? And you can um, cheat and use the two that I told you to pick songs from. Yeah, Blaster <laughs> Master and Journey to Soyuz, yep. which is a great game, by the way. Journey to Soyuz is great. It is a lot of fun. That's great music. It's, uh, it's, it's not as good as uh, Mega Man, I don't think, gameplay-wise, but the music, of course, is phenomenal. It's a good NES game. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think for my money, Journey to Silius, pound for pound, might be the best thing that Kodaka ever did. It's it's really, really good stuff, but we're going to hear a little bit about that because I have asked Skeletroy to curate this playlist, and before I uh, I talk about the title of this episode, Troy, you... um. You kind of took a very specific tack with the playlist on today's show. Do you want to talk about how you decided to go about featuring uh, some of the best work of one of our favorite composers today? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I was listening to uh, the previous episodes this season, and uh, like I thought it was really neat, you know, just listening to an entire retrospective of, uh, of a composer's history you know, boiled down into, like, an hour or two. But when it came to, uh, Naoki Kodaka, well, first of all, I, I was, uh, sort of having issues with, like, how many songs do I pick? Do I let Bedroth and Shoot Kapow pick songs? If so, how many? And, <laughs> and eventually I was just like, no, I, I gotta take the wheel on this thing. Yep. And, yep. <laughs> And so, um, essentially, I tried to stick with with Kodaka's NES work for the most part, because I kind of feel that, uh, like, you had played a, a song from Albert Odyssey on a previous episode. Yeah. And, uh, honestly, I think it's a great song, but I don't really enjoy where he went with the updated technology like i i appreciate what he could do but i feel like it to uh i think it lost a little bit of its charm well for me it it's sort of like how uh, metallica fans feel about the first four albums <laughs> uh that that to me is his nes work gotcha yeah i think that's something a lot of our our users can relate to with that, the, the later work of an artist maybe not being quite as imaginative, groundbreaking, uh, it, or it could just be a matter of maybe them just not being in their best element. Kodaka reigned supreme on the NES. He had experience on the Genesis and on the SNES, 
and on the Saturn with uh, the the follow-up to Albert Odyssey, but it was really the NES where I think his talent really shone. And unlike the composers that we discussed earlier this season, Kodaka really does not have um, a super huge discography. Uh, He was active for about 10 years, He's really almost more comparable if you just look like quantity wise. He's more comparable to some of the composers we talked about last week on the Patreon episode than he is to composers like Yuzo Koshiro and Yoko Shimomura, and of course the giants like uh, Uematsu and Koji Kondo and the, uh, the lately departed Koichi Sugiyama of Dragon Quest fame. Um, to be honest, um, and sorry to cut you off there. But I, I find that uh, he almost has, like, a, a good middle ground in between. And, like, that's another thing that I tried to showcase with this playlist. Is, uh, like, you're going to hear a lot of really great music in the span of, like, four years. Right, yeah. He did, he did so many soundtracks just in that time mm-hmm. that, uh, like... To me, it's it's kind of amazing that, you know, you could put out that much work in that short of a time. It is. Uh, in the whole time that he was composing, according to Wikipedia, he, he recorded the soundtracks or composed the soundtracks for 26 games. And 20 of those games were between 1986 and 1992. <laughs> it's just in that six year span, he composed some of the most memorable soundtracks. In 1988 alone, you've got Ripple Island, Freedom Force, Blaster Master, Nankin No Adventure, and Platoon. I mean, 8788, just looking at those two years, it's some of the best music that ever came out of the, of the NES and Famicom. It, it's really, really fantastic. There's not a whole lot of personal information about Kodaka online in comparison to some of the other composers that we've talked about. He is a Japanese a video game music composer, worked for Sunsoft pretty much the whole time that he was composing. He is currently a professor of music at a couple of different universities. He purportedly sometimes composes new music for special events. I have not heard nor been able to get my hands on any of that, and frankly, I'm not as interested in it, honestly, as, as some of his newer stuff. And I don't think that Kodaka would be upset about that, based on some, some stuff I found out about him that I'm going to kind of sprinkle in through the episode. I will say briefly, he first learned to play piano during his early childhood, but quit formal training at age 7 uh, because he decided that he liked popular music more. <laughs> the kind of stuff you would hear on the radio. <laughs> he did resume his classical studies in high school and majored in composition at the Aichi Prefecture University of the Arts. And uh, after graduation, actually, one of his teachers, um, (laughs) he he knew somebody at what was called the uh, the Sun Corporation back then, and he um, he told them, hey, I know this young composer who plays at the Game Center all day, and that was how Kodaka got introduced to Sunsoft (laughs) by one of his teachers, so... Awesome. Yeah, that's how that's how he got into the gig, and we will talk about this a little bit. But um, one of his very frequent compatriots was Nobuyuki Hara. Um, he worked with a couple of other sound programmers on these soundtracks, but all of the music that we're going to be hearing tonight was composed by Kodaka himself. And uh, I guess with that, oh, and I don't know if I mentioned this early on, but um. The, uh, I, I, I couldn't not play in with uh, our, our play-in track because it's just iconic, not just for Kodaka, but also for VGM Podcasting. For anybody who does not know, uh, that was Area 1 from Blaster Master, which has, of course, now been made famous as the theme song for the Legacy Music Hour. So, um, let in with a little bit of that. And, uh, nice. That was, I guess that was my one, one pick for the, uh, for the episode. Uh, Because I haven't told you yet, but I'm also going to let you pick out whatever we use for our blooper reel, so. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, do you want to go ahead and uh, get us into the first game of the evening? Sure. Um, I realize that uh, we've been uh, talking the NES up a lot so far, but um, 
we're going to subvert that for just a couple minutes. Because, uh, as Sue Kapow had mentioned, uh, probably Kadaka's, like, number one single would be Streets of Desolation from Batman. <laughs> uh, but there's a PC Engine version, and we're gonna listen to that now. Technically, that was Main BGM 2 from Batman the Video Game for the PC Engine, which was released in 1990, uh, developed and published as everything on the playlist is going to be by Sunsoft, and composed, of course, by Naoki Kodaka. Now, before we get into this, um, we have played this song on the show before, uh, as we, we mentioned briefly a minute ago, but Chukapau, I have two questions for you. Number one, do you know what the PC Engine was called in the States? Um, no, what was it? We've mentioned it on the show a couple of times. Um, I want to see if you remembered. It's a system that was out around the same time as the NES and the Super NES. It was technically the first 16-bit system. Okay. And 16 is the key number here. Is there a system that, that you think of there? Okay, I'll take you off the hot seat. It's the Turbo Graphics 16. I uh, have, I don't remember ever hearing that. You, you don't have any recollection. Oh wow, I have done a poor job, or maybe you've just done a poor job paying attention. Probably that. But yeah, the Turbo Graphics 16 <laughs> or the uh, the PC Engine is. Uh, we can get into the hardware and stuff like that, but we're not going to because really this is an NES episode bookended by a couple of other things. The second question for you, Shukapow. How do you think this compares to the NES version of this song? Um, I think it's pretty good. They sound pretty similar, but this one has some more like, you know, high quality, you know, like sound samples. Like the instrument sounds. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Good. Good word. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's a matter of presentation. It's not really a matter of quality to me. Uh, Troy, what do you think? What's your opinion about that? I mean, anything that's on the turbo just immediately sounds good. <laughs> so, like, when you take a song that's already good and port it over to the turbo, like, that's it's just guaranteed success. Uh, the, the rest of the soundtrack is actually all different than the NES version. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, I recommend listening to the rest of them as well. But, um, yeah, like, I, I love the drums in this. Like, they just sound so good. Well, and if I remember, the rest of that game, was it also composed by Kodaka, or was it by a different yep. composer? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. The yeah, he did all the Batmans. He did the, the Genesis, he did the arcade version. I knew he did the Genesis and that that was a completely different soundtrack. The um, the Super Mercado Bros. did a whole Batman episode one time, and I definitely recommend everybody check that out if you like this. Uh, there's obviously a lot of Kodaka on that episode, and it's really cool. But the uh, for me, it's hard to get away from from the NES just for nostalgia reasons, but objectively speaking... 
this this is a better arrangement. Uh, the bass as well, which Sunsoft is famous for, especially on the NES, but the bass is just really, really solid <laughs> on this. And like you said, the drums are just out of this world. The NES, without the suspension of disbelief, the NES was never just really great at pulling off drums, although Kodaka came as close as anybody else to subverting that. <laughs> so... This was a, a nice way to start out this playlist. But anything else you've got about the uh, this Batman composition that is so iconic? Not so much about the composition, but just going back to uh, playlist selection. When I initially talked to you about doing this episode, uh, it was still when uh, the show was under the 15-song format. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, honestly, I'd blocked out a whole Batman section. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I was like, oh, well, I can take one from the NES and one from the Turbo and one from the Genesis and one from the Game Boy and one from the Arcade, <laughs> and there's a third of the episode already done. Yep. <laughs> I guess that's that's where we uh, we had the most attrition when, when I let you know that we'd drop down to a 10-song format. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, oh, what do I do now? So, I, uh, I think I managed. I think you did. I, it's really, I, it's good that you, you left something from the PC Engine on here because we really are heavy on Nintendo platforms and the Genesis on this show. And so anytime we get to play anything else, it really is kind of a treat. So this was really, really cool. And I am actually... I've heard everything by Kodaka at this point. I've listened through his whole backlog at least once, but some of these games I'm not as familiar with as I am with the heavy hitters, so I'm excited to hear where we're going to be going. Um, what have we got next? Uh, okay, so now we're going to actually go back pretty well to the beginning. Uh, this is from Atlantis no Nazo. Or uh, I think it's uh, Mystery of Atlantis. Uh, and yeah, it wasn't put out for the NES. This was a Famicom game. And uh, yeah, let's check it out. Zone 1 theme from Atlantis No Nazo, released for the Super Famicom in 1986, and yeah, second on our list of Kodaka tracks. Back toward the beginning of his uh, his compositional life, and that was fun. That was a really fun little short loop. I've got a couple of things to say about that that I don't want to forget. So, did you notice, Skeletroy, that in there, there is a chord progression that is reminiscent of a pretty famous classical piece? A pack of bell cannon? There you go, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that's, that's really cool. And what's really interesting about this to me is Lee talked about on the Ben Dag Leash episode how with the uh, Commodore... You, you really, you, Commodore 64, the composers couldn't play a lot of different, uh, they couldn't do like full on chords, and so a lot of times they resorted to arpeggios. And we hear that happening here with this track, and the this is some, some really lively arpeggio work. Uh, Shukaba, what did you think of this? This was delightful. I liked it a lot. That's a good word. Good word for it. Uh, Good word that you use a lot. <laughs> I could hear this. Um, I could hear this playing for a while and and not really getting old. Skeletor, did you ever play Mickey Mouse Capades on the NES? I own that game. You still own that game? Uh, no, I don't. 
I don't have any of my NES games anymore. Me neither. That's a tragic story for another day. I actually played a fair amount of that game when I was a kid, and then I go online and find out everybody thinks it's an awful game. I have the exact same experience. I played quite <laughs> a bit of it when I was younger, too, and it's one of those things that we didn't know what we didn't know, but this reminds me some of some of the music in that game. It's just that, that bubbly, happy, happy sound. Yeah, oh, yeah, now that you mention it, the, uh, the stage one theme. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking of. Yep. Yeah. Give me give me some of your thoughts on this one. How, how did this make a playlist of 10 out of all of the other tracks he's done? Uh, well, basically, I chose this one because, uh, like, I wanted to showcase Kodaka basically before the sound that we know him for. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. But, like, how you were saying about how, uh, you know, the NES isn't really known for drums, he didn't even bother with this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, when you think about Kadaka's compositions, is not normal. Um, but yeah, like, uh, this is a very, like, stock Famicom sound. And, uh, it, it's just kind of neat to hear, you know, what he would do before he started innovating. Mm-hmm. It, it's funny, I was, uh, I was curious and I looked back at the, um, the playlist that, that Brian put together on BG Mania when I joined him for their Kodaka episode. Uh, I actually recommended BGM1 from Atlantis No Nazo, which I'm not sure if this is the same track or not, but, uh, it didn't sound very familiar to me. This was back um, several months ago now, so I don't really know. But what is funny is that the next song on our playlist tonight, um, I did recommend for that playlist then. So I've definitely heard the next track that we're playing. Oh, awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to stay in 1986 for this next one. Troy, do you want to kind of introduce this this next track we're going to be hearing? Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, the tower or castle theme from, uh, the Wing of Medulla, also for the Famicom. <laughs> Tower Castle theme from The Wing of Medulla, released for the Super, not the Super, for the Famicom in 1986. <laughs> and, man, I don't know about you, Troy, for me, it's crazy to think that this came out the same year as that track we just listened to from Atlantis No Nazo. Yeah, well, that that's what I was talking about at the top of the episode, is, like, you can see the evolution that this guy has, like, really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're not quite there yet but um like this is uh he's definitely letting his metal influences show <laughs> yeah we we go from almost a, a classic or um almost cartoonish song to uh to, yeah this that's much more rocking much more metal something you might hear on the radio at that time and it definitely does foreshadow some of what we're going to be getting into uh Shukapau, what did you think about this song that was very cool if you were going to place this in a game, um, what do you think this would accompany? What, what, either what kind of game, what kind of level, uh, what kind of area? Hmm. I'm not sure. Probably some kind of like platforming, like vertical level with a bunch of platforms and a bunch of projectiles. Yeah, I could kind of th like a run and gun type thing, um, almost like a Mega Man or Cilia style thing. I have no idea what the Wing of Medulla is like, but I get that same sort of feel from 
from this track. Really cool stuff. This may also be a good time to mention that a lot of times I will play different remixes or versions of the songs we listen to underneath talking. And whenever possible on today's playlist, I am going to be playing your uh, thrash versions of these songs, Troy. <laughs> oh, right on. I definitely recommend that everybody go and check those out. I'll be putting some links in the show notes. And uh, I think I'm also going to throw up a link to the BG Mania episode where they talked about Kodaka, because if you like this stuff, you're definitely going to want to go check that out. Um, the Super Mercado Bros have done a Mar uh, Kodaka episode. It, he, he's a pretty frequently cited composer in VGM podcasting. He he was influential to the sound of, I think, a lot of folks who came after him. So, but yeah, I think we have one more uh, Troy track before we come to the first Shoot Kapow track of the show. And if I am not mistaken, this next uh, soundtrack is pretty meaningful for you, sir. Is that right? Uh, yeah, this one, uh, oh, jeez. I... I actually didn't find out about this one until, uh, like, my emulator days. But, like, from the opening notes of this soundtrack, like, this is where Kadaka brings the metal. <laughs> this is where his sound is fully realized. And, uh, for those of you who listened to our, uh, the last episode I was on, where, uh, I briefly discussed, uh, the PCM and, uh, you know, just different types of video game sound. Mm -hmm. This is where Kadaka really found his footing. Because he decided to start using the, uh, the PCM track for bass samples. Yep. Which meant that not only did they, these soundtracks start having a really robust uh, bass sound to them, he started using the uh, the triangle channel for uh, like the the symbols and stuff for drums. So from here on out was where Sunsoft just absolutely captivated me with what they could do with video game music, with NES music, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, and uh, it's all Kadaka. Like, he didn't invent this stuff, but he sure innovated it. Yeah, it, I think that Konami set the stage for some of these things with the things that, that some of their composers did with the channels, but what Kodaka did here and what he set in motion at Sunsoft, renowned soundtracks like Mr. Gimmick would not have existed without what Kodaka did before. And Shukapau, I think this is a really good sort of learning experience for you because you're just getting into learning about different instruments and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that this more than anything is going to show the instruments at your disposal are important, but what's more important is what you do with them. And sometimes subverting expectation purely on the level of instrument choice will go a long way toward making your sound stand out because that's exactly what Kodak is doing here. Yeah. But that was a pretty long build up for the track. Troy, what are we going to be listening to next? Uh, this is Stage 5, a terrorist hideout of Freedom Force. Shukapau, get ready. Get ready for this and hold on to your socks.
of a Stage 5 terrorist hideout from Freedom Force, released in 1988. And, mm, man, what's, what's so cool here is that the way that Kodaka sounds like he's making those drums stand out is that, like a lot of other composers did back then, he's using the noise channel for his drums, but he is undergirding it, like you said, with the PCM channel to really give them that extra oomph, especially on the kick. And, I mean, it sounds like it's a stage theme, but to me, this is a straight-up boss battle tune. Like, this is a boss fight, 100%. What do you think, Shukapo? Yep, definitely. <laughs> Did you like this one? Mm-hmm. It was really good. Anything in particular stand out to you that I haven't already talked about? Um, I like the percussion. Yep, good stuff. Man, well, Troy, uh, you talked about this one a lot before we came in, but... Keep going, man. <laughs> this is oh, this is good stuff. Yeah, it's um. So the the thing that I love about Freedom Force is um. Well, like you said, uh, it sounds more like a boss fight or whatever. Um, Freedom Force is a light gun game. Okay. Yeah. So it. I mean, it's basically kind of all just you know. Like, there's one uh, level mm-hmm. where, uh, like, you're at an airport and, like, you're shooting bad guys out of a plane. <laughs> gotcha. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, to be honest, the entire soundtrack just sounds like boss fights. Like, you can hear where, uh, you know, like, where he was going with stuff like Batman and Journey to Silius and whatnot. But with this one, it's like, strip away the melody just all aggression all percussion all just in your face that's freedom force yeah it sounds really balls to the wall for sure it's got that metal metal sound to it and for those of you that have never like even heard of this game i strongly recommend you go on youtube check out the like the intro cutscene. it's phenomenal and this is in 1988. Like, this is a 33-year-old game. <laughs> That's incredible to me, just what he's able to do. And before we get into uh, to our next pick, I, I want to talk a little bit about... We're getting into the meat, I think, of Kodaka's work now. And... Um, in an interview on Schmuppulations, which I, I think I'm also going to link in the show notes, I recommend everybody check this out. This is a very rare interview because I don't think Kodaka did a lot of these. Uh, but he mentions that when he was at Sunsoft, he always worked together with a team. And what he would do, kind of similarly to what Koichi Sugiyama did, is he would write his songs on sheet music at home, and then he would hand them over to the sound team at work. And sometimes he might also attach a demo tape where he would like actually perform. And man, I would love to get my hands on some of those demo tapes for some of this stuff. I'd love to get my hands on the sheet music for this song. Oh, yeah. Like, it would just be all 16th notes right in a row. Mm-hmm. but he said once the technology got to a point where he could do a little more with the music he would listen back to the particular sounds that the team had selected and give them feedback like this should feel looser this part needs to sing more um and this kind of go back and forth but really network with them to to make everything come out the way he wanted it um he, he's really, really generous to his team. He said the people working on the sound team were all incredibly talented, that everybody was really tight-knit, but they were also just a, really a, a real group of professionals, and that they inspired and challenged each other. A quote from the interview, he says, They had it all. Creativity, tenacity, good theoretical knowledge, and flexibility. And specifically for the tracks we're coming up with, uh, he would work with uh, implementers and sound programmers like Nobuyuki Hara, Shinichi Seiya, uh, Naohisa Moroda. Um, Nobuyuki Hara you will actually see mentioned with Kodaka a lot, just hand in hand. And Kodaka was, again, he was the one who wrote the music. Nobuyuki Hara was the one who made it happen on the NES. And so a lot of the choices of the different channels to use, um, I think a lot of that really falls with Nobuyuki Hara, but 
the interview makes it clear it was definitely a collaborative effort. Um, but I, I feel like Kodaka would really want us to mention that and highlight the fact that this was this was a team effort. Shukapal, we are now up to your first track of the episode because in this same year, 1988, Kodaka made what a lot of people consider to be his first really big hit soundtrack. And a lot of that's because this game was one of Sunsoft's first really big hits on the NES. Shukapal, what track are we going to be listening to from Blaster Master? Um, we're going to be playing Area 2. Nice! From Blaster Master. was Area 2 from Blaster Master. All right. Good stuff. Why did you pick that one out of the uh, whole Blaster Master soundtrack, Shukapal? Honestly, it's just, like, the only one that clicked with me. None of the other ones really, like... Yeah. What do, what do you think it might be about this particular composition that clicked with you? I know you've got certain styles that you like. What, what was it about this one that you like? Um, well... Uh, I definitely liked the percussion a lot. The snare was really cool. As always, the snare. Because <laughs> you did, you did listen to the whole soundtrack, right? Yep. <laughs> you understand I asked that only because you picked Area 2. <laughs> and I told you you couldn't pick Area 1. So, alright. Still a good song. Oh yeah. I mean... <laughs> Uh, uh, I was going to pick a Blaster Master song. Uh, it was uh, Area 7. It's like the ice area. Mm, yeah. Really good. So I mean, the whole soundtrack's great. I might have gone with Area 6. Um, I think... That would have been my choice after 7. Yeah, I think I think that, that's <laughs> that's when you, when you fight the crab, although the bosses have their own theme in this. But, yeah, it's, the whole thing is really good. Um... And it just sort of, like, <laughs> had a cool melody. Yeah, and melody is another of uh, Kodaka's just real strong suits. I, you, you both know I really love melody, especially on the NES, and this is really good stuff. But yeah, the percussion, like, you can actually hear a distinct snare, hi-hat, and kick drum in this. There is no better sounding snare. There, there might have been some stuff that was as good, but for me, there's no better sounding snare on the NES than what Kodaka has here in Blaster Master. What do you think, Troy? Oh, agreed. Um, and yeah, like this is uh, this is full blown the Kodaka sound. Like w when you think Sunsoft, this is what you think of. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I love this song. Um, I really like how, uh, th there's two distinct sections to it. Like, the first part feels really hopeful, and the second part is, it's got this nervous tension to it. Um, uh, but that bass line, like, it, it keeps you punching through. Mm hmm and, and that's what I really love about it. And then again, you know, like you are saying about, like, how you can hear the full drums 
Yeah, for my money, Sunsoft has the best sound on the NES. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a reason that the soundtrack of, of Blaster Master is uh, on a lot of people's just like top soundtracks for the NES. It's really, really great. The game is a lot of fun, too. I haven't played it in many, many years, but obviously it spawned a lot of sequels. Um, XVGM Radio actually fairly recently did a sort of series retrospective of the Blaster Master series. So definitely go check that out if you're interested. But I really like – it's one of those NES games that features – different play styles within the game and that was always really fun for me because it kind of mixed things up uh, don't don't think i have to spend a lot of yep. time on that because yeah, if you had an nes you played blaster master and if you you know grew up past this time you know you can check it out if you want to but it's it's really it's really fun stuff well, we have another uh, Skeletroy pick before we move to Shukapau's second pick of the episode. And I'm excited about this. This game is not as good as Blaster Master at all. But the soundtrack is is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I kind of feel like this game gets a bit of a bum rap, though. Because it's not as bad as everybody says it is. Like, it's, it's basically Blaster Master without the tank. Okay, you know, I, I can see that. If, if, if you were just in the on-foot sections, that's Fester's Quest. Okay, there there you go, there you go. You, you got a good point. And we've already talked about how Mickey Mouse Capade maybe gets a bad rap too, but... Uh, and you know what? I think, if I remember, on the BG Mania episode, Frank said the same thing about Fester's Quest. Like, I'm not trying to say it's a great game or anything, but, like, it... it it's that internet hyperbole. Like, if it's mm -hmm. not the best thing ever, it's a trash fire. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's one of those. It's like, don't knock it till you tried it. It's worth checking out, at least. And the, the Adams and the family, music's good. The Adams Family games had some pretty had some pretty good music. The games were almost universally mediocre, but um, this particular game, of course, since it's a Kodaka jam, is really fantastic. I don't remember. I don't think I played it on this show, but I know. I've heard it. The sewer theme for Fester's Quest is really, really nice. Really kind of a creepy vibe. Um, but this theme that we're going to play is also a lot of fun. What are we going to be listening to next? This is the boss battle theme from Fester's Quest. Boss Battle from Fester's Quest. And I just can't get the smile off my face. That was so much fun. Uh, all right, so we don't steal all your words. Shoot Kapow, you go first. What did you like about this track? Um, first off, I actually heard you from the other room while you were saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> um, well, it was... That was really fun. Um, the time signature in the intro part was very interesting. Yep. Yeah, I'm not even sure what that would be. Troy, that, that's the part with the uh, the orc hits, which we'll come back to. Can you pick out that, that time signature? It's obviously uh, going back and forth. Yeah, I'm not really sure. It's, uh... Like, there's just so many notes. It's almost like the uh, the intro to Through the Fire and Flames by Dragon Force. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's definitely a metal technique. I mean, when it comes to musical complexity, 
there is no more sophisticated sound palette in popular music than metal. It's it's really so many people don't understand how complex the uh, the chord structure, the scales, the the time signatures that exist in metal. Um, and Kodaka brings that full force to the NES. This was a fantastic choice. And we've got we've got flipping orc hits on the NES, like full on orc hits. That's amazing. You're welcome. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. You know how much I love them. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I I haven't obviously chronicled all the orc hits on the NES, but there's this and there's Super C. Hmm. Yeah, I think for. Uh, I mean, Capcom were the kings of just super fun melodies, uh, but when it just comes to pure like quality of this type of sound, Konami and Sunsoft, I, I feel like we're in sort of an arm wrestling match because <laughs> uh, they're both yeah. fantastic. Oh, for sure. But, and this this is so fun, so good. Thank you for this track. So far, this is my track of the episode. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing that I noticed on this one was. Um, this is really the evolution of uh, the programming of the drum parts. Because mm. if you heard all those quick little fills, just the brap, brap, um, love it. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's the team pushing the limits of what they can do. It is. It is. And it's actually, that's a really cool segue into something I wanted to share. Um, I'm going to read this straight from the the interview on Shmupulations because that was what Kodaka remembers Nobuyuki Hara for. Um, I did not know this. Apparently, Nobuyuki Hara passed away in his mid-twenties after a sudden illness uh, not too long after Kodaka um, finished working on, on NES stuff. So this would have been in the early 90s. Um, but he says that Nobuyuki Hara was the main sound producer for Batman, Battle Formula, and others. He later left Sunsoft, but he was an exceptional sound programmer. His early death in his mid-twenties from a sudden illness was truly a tragedy. He would say to me, Kodaka, wait till you hear the great sounds I've just created. Please write a good song for them. <laughs> and then he'd wait patiently at my home, uh, my home office, until the dawn as I composed. And when I handed the sheet to him, he'd take it and say, leave the rest to me as he raced back to the office. I have many wonderful memories just like that. When he showed the finished song to me and I gave my seal of approval, a huge expression of happiness welled up on his face. And that is just... It's such a sweet story, but also it just speaks to the amount of talent that went into this music and the passion that went into it, even back then. And that's one of the things I love so much about this and why I think it's, it is so worth celebrating in this podcast community that's popped up. Oh, for sure. And like it in a story like that, especially like passion and energy is a cyclical thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like, if if I'm excited about something, and then you get excited about that thing, then I'm going to be even more excited. Yeah. So, yeah, like, you come up with this cool sound driver, and I write some cool music. Uh, yeah. Th that, you know, that's both parties wanting to make everything better. For sure. And, like, that, that's how you achieve greatness. Like, it... Uh, and I mean, that's like, this is probably going to sound weird from somebody who, on the outside, you know, does everything by himself. I don't. You know, <laughs> like, I have people that I bounce ideas off of because they get better like that. It's so much easier to do something, I think, that's worthwhile and meaningful when you do it with other people. It's it's really hard to come up with stuff all by yourself. And that's why, and Shukapal, forgive me if I ever don't do this, but that's why I always try to respond with enthusiasm when you share your compositions with me. Because I really do think you've got a lot of talent that I'm really excited to kind of showcase later on in this season. And... Um, if uh, you know, if you ever want to uh, collaborate on something or bounce ideas off stuff, you know I'm here. So 
Actually, we, we might be sharing this later in the season, but one of the things I think you might be bringing to the show is a collaboration of sorts, <laughs> although I didn't know about it until after the facts. But for now, we were talking about uh, Kudaka compositions, and in, in 1989, um, after coming off of that year, that 88 that I mentioned before, there are only two soundtracks he worked on, and that is this one, Fester's Quest and Batman, that we've already talked about. And I think that you can really hear that in the sound of both of those games. There, there's a lot of similar sort of like level of the uh, the implementation in these games. But uh, I mean, it says two games, but like there were four Batmans that year, and then one the next year. That is true. That so is true. It, it, it's not like it was just two games. It, he he still did a fair bit that year. <laughs> well, and what I think is cool is, once again, you move to the very next year, and you hear yet another evolution in in the sound. And I think we just got some insight into that, because like you said, when, when you've got this positive feedback loop of people just building on each other, you are going to have more rapid development, I think, in things like this. And so we move from 1989 with Fester's Quest and Batman to the year when he composed some of my favorite stuff. Um, we're not featuring it tonight, but I really want to give a shout out to uh, Nantetet Baseball, which... It sounds like NES baseball music. Like, you listen to, yep. to baseball stars and RBI baseball and bases loaded. This would fit right in with those, and it is just fantastic. But you've got one of the tracks that you're going to be... The next track you're going to be bringing, which is from a game I actually really enjoyed when I was a kid, and one of the first games where I really noticed the sound of the game I was playing. But before that, we've got my personal favorite Kodaka soundtrack. Once again, pound for pound, every track in this game is a banger. And you've done a full album of thrash remixes for this soundtrack. I'm talking about Journey to Silius. And on our very first episode, we played the title theme of Journey to Silius. Uh, Shukapau, what are we going to be playing for this episode? We are going to be playing Stage 3. Stage three from Journey to Silius. I don't want to stop listening. It's so good. <laughs> Very nice choice. Uh, I would have been happy if you'd gone with any song from this this soundtrack, but why stage three? Like, obviously, you liked it the best, but why do you think you liked it the best? What is it about this that you love so much? It's just that guitar, the melody, like the do 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 do. It's just, it's so, and then when, then when it goes, <laughs> yep. 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And the that that lead, the intro, where it's like doo, doo, that that it's got that Sport Sando sound to it, where it's the the initial hit is almost muted, and then they've got that quick crescendo up. This is such a sophisticated song on 8-bit hardware with five channels. <laughs> it's I, I, I can't say more than that. It's just, this is incredible. This is like genius level work on both the composition and on the implementation. This is why I love this tra- this soundtrack so much. And Troy, thank you, thank you for letting us pick this. But like I said, I would have been happy with anything from this game. Oh, yeah, like, the entire soundtrack is just fantastic. Yeah, I like, there. you couldn't have picked a song, and I would have gone, oh, well, I didn't want to go with that <laughs> one. Yeah, it's... Th- this is in the running for me for best soundtracks on the NES. Um, it is definitely in my top three any day of the week, and it, it, it could very well be my very favorite soundtrack, and... I didn't play this game until I was over 35 years old. <laughs> I had never even heard of this game until I discovered VGM Podcasts, and I don't know why, it just never crossed my path, but it's my favorite to this day. It's so good. I love it so much, and I could gush about it forever. Um, but do either of you have anything else specific to say about this this track or this score? Maybe the 90 song Siva Gunner playlist. 19. 19. So. <laughs> 19. Oh, dang. But As still. I said 90. Yeah. Anybody who likes Siva Gunner and his whole shtick, go check it out because I'm sure it's going to be good music, as silly as it gets. Um, I feel like Siva Gunner is kind of like the Weird Al of uh, VGM. <laughs> so. yep. It's very accurate. <laughs> yeah. Troy, where do you think this kind of fits in on the whole uh, development of Kodaka? Do you agree with me that this is probably the high point of his of his work, or do you think it gets better from here? Um, okay, so like, I'll straight up say that this is my favorite Kodaka soundtrack, and yeah, like, as, if you're going with, uh, like, original NES soundtracks, then yeah, it's top three guaranteed the only thing though you kind of get to a point where you get so good that at some point you kind of have to trade off some things uh like you'll notice that the drums in this weren't as good as in the past couple soundtracks not that it takes away anything from the actual composition itself but you know like when we're talking about how how good, like, the bass and the snare and the hi-hat sound. That is and- true. There's a lot of tom work in this, but you're right. The, the the core, like the bass and snare, it's not as solid. That's true. So, like, compromises are, are to be made. And, yeah, I mean, it's... So, like, yeah, to be honest, like, I kind of feel like they hit the, the zenith. And, like, at this point, like, there's only sideways to go. Mm, yeah. Yeah, good point. But that's the thing, like, when you've mastered your craft, where is there to go? You know, like, you want to you wanna work on different sounds, like, with Journey to Celius, it, like, the bass is so good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like, maybe you'll trade off a little fidelity of the drums for bass for this time around. Maybe next time you'll trade something else, like, it... it it's just a mastered going, I need to try new things, and I've mastered this aspect of it. So, what can I change? Well, and just the instrumental diversity here, like the, those lead synths that, that sound like they could come out of Batman, and then you get into that, that guitar that's like the, you know, the, the focal instrument, but then the part that you could mentioned first, the do 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 those sort of chimey sounds that he brings in there 
There's a lot of diversity of instrumentation in this that's really impressive for the NES as well. Uh, so yeah, but you're right, and I mean it's a limitation of the hardware that you have to you have to cut corners somewhere if you're really going to bring something else to the forefront. But I think that's what I love about the fact that we're doing this whole episode is because you can see what these true masters of the craft were able to do when they wanted to focus on different things. And I think you you hit the nail on the head when you talked about that there's nowhere to go but sideways here, because the next track we're talking about, to me, is a really lateral move. This is another soundtrack where I love almost every track. Now, even the shop theme, which is a little bit cheesy and stereotypical, but I like almost every track in this soundtrack as well. Really all of it, I think. And um, <laughs> it, it's funny because this is based on the sequel to a movie, and I don't think the original movie ever got a game, at least not on the NES. Um, no, I don't think so. And yet this game, I mean, it, it was fun. It was pretty cool. It was a very different t- type of game, uh, kind of similar, again, to the on-foot areas of Blaster Master, but the music is just so much fun. What are we going to be... Uh, this is a classic. I think anybody who is a fan of VGM has probably heard this at some point. What are we going to be listening to next, Troy? Uh, so next is uh, The Office, Stage 5 from Gremlins 2. That was stage 1-2, uh, The Office from Gremlins 2, the new batch for the NES, released in 1990. I do think that this also is played later on, because there are definitely more stages in this game than there are tracks on the soundtrack playlist. Um, so when Troy said five, I don't think he was wrong. I think it might have just, just come back, but... Well, it was sort of like I was saying, like, the uh, the entire soundtrack is sort of a, a late motif, and, uh, like, I'm planning on doing, like, a medley cover of, uh, like, I think it's five different songs from the game. Because, oh, I can't uh, wait uh, for that. Uh, so, yeah, like, stage five, it uses the same chord progression and everything, it's just, it's sort of like a part two of this song. Actually, okay, yeah, perfect. Put, put that underneath while we're talking. Okay. And then will. people will understand. Well, that's a good <laughs> and idea. And they won't I write hateful that. comments to me about not knowing things. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I'm not I'm not quite successful enough to uh, to get hateful comments. Um, <laughs> j- just this year in the past few months, I um, I did get some of my first dislikes, and so I, I am getting noticed by some people. That's pretty cool. But um, but I haven't gotten any bad comments yet, so um, I do get some constructive corrections from from my friends in the community. But I welcome those definitely. Uh, 
Well, but... I'd never do anything like that. <laughs> like when I say that uh, that Yuzo Koshiro's work on the PC-88 was the pinnacle of, of sound hardware at that time. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, I welcome it. It's all great stuff. I love it. Uh, I want to be accurate, and I do know I can get carried away in my enthusiasm sometimes. But it is nice to know that we see eye to eye about Journey to Silly as being the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> but Gremlins, man, you're right. This is a sideways move because this is not in any way inferior to Journey to Silius. There is some real sophistication of of composition here. It just goes so many different places. Um, there's always so many things going on. Um, I love this whole soundtrack as well. Uh, like I said, it's the, the the area one theme has got this really kicking melody of the do 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 do. It's just the whole thing sounds so much like the feeling of the Gremlins movies, and yep. I think. If you had ever watched these movies, which we should watch Gremlins and Gremlins 2 sometime, you, you and Dusk are definitely old enough now. <laughs> Troy, my, my wife and I were talking recently, but this is one of those, Gremlins is one of those movies that like, uh, how old were you when you first watched Gremlins? Oh, jeez. Um, roughly. Uh, like 11 or 12. Really? Because, like, for me, I was probably eight or nine. <laughs> and and I feel like a lot of our generation, probably, maybe it's because I'm American and you're Canadian and we're, we're more intense down here, I don't know. But, <laughs> um, but I, I feel like a lot of our generation, there were movies that we probably had no business watching at that age. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, for sure. Gremlins is... The basic story of Gremlins is that... The, this little furry creature called a mogwai is bought by this uh, the, this little, this teenager buys him from this mystical old man, and the old man gives him very strict instructions for how to take care of the mogwai, um, like don't feed it after midnight, don't let it get wet, stuff like that, and of course those instructions are ignored, and so <laughs> um, from the mogwai, uh, Gizmo spawn these. The gremlins, like the picture that you see on the, on the uh, on the box art, and the gremlins wreak havoc in this little town. All this happens to go on around Christmas time, and so this is one of those movies where there's debate about whether it's a Christmas movie. But um, <laughs> it's it's got comedic elements to it. Like there's some really funny stuff in here, but it's dark comedy, and it's also horror because you've got these little monsters running around, and and they're they're some sort of truly terrifying things in this movie, but. So it's creepy, but also kind of funny. Gizmo is just adorable. He he looks like a furry, but not uh, furry. He looks like a Furby, but not <laughs> terrifying. Um, but knowing that this is kind of like a creepy comedy style of movie, I think that puts this soundtrack in a new light because it's just perfect for that. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so good. But but you talk for a while because you picked this track. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, the, uh, the thing that I really like about this one, uh, especially composition-wise, uh, not only just, you know, how it seems like it goes off in a hundred different directions, but at the <laughs> same time, it's completely laser-focused the whole time. Mm hmm Um, I love how, uh, there's that part... Like, there's uh, sort of like a, a break, and then it almost sounds like this metal rhythm guitar is coming in. Just uh, just picking up a storm. Um, yeah. But the other thing that I really love about this soundtrack, and why, like, it is another lateral shift, is, um, like, with, uh, like, with any of the other ones, like Journey to Silius, Blaster Master, Batman, like, there's... There's a very clear delineation between instruments. Uh, with that, like, it's it's so chaotic that, like, you can't pinpoint, okay, this instrument is doing this thing. Uh, it, it like, it, it's just this big mash of, uh, of sound. And, like, that's, uh, another one of the, uh, the NES's strengths, is the fact that, you know, because it's... You know, it's all just uh, FM synth. 
they're not actual instruments. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like what we think of as as like the bass channel or whatever. If you put that up two octaves, nobody knows the difference between that and the melody channel. Yeah. Uh, you can do some really cool blending of sounds, and this one does it just gorgeously. It does, and I think that whether you approach it from a technical standpoint or from a compositional standpoint, this soundtrack would be a really, really rich, just well of... You could dig into this so much and and just take away so much knowledge from it uh, for just how to construct these things. And this is another one that I would love to see the original sheet music for. Because how you put something like this to paper, I just don't understand. And then to be able to program it (laughs) into a tracker... Like, that's another thing I'd love to watch is just, like, the original tracker of this on YouTube. Because you know it has to be just wild. (laughs) Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, and do correct me if I'm wrong, um, this next soundtrack is one of Kodaka's latest on the NES. I think the only NES soundtracks... That, that were soundtrack that was later than this. No, this was. This was, I think, the the, la- the last NES soundtrack that he did. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So we're going to be listening to a song from Euphoria, the saga. And this was in the... This was in the Hebereke series. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, which I think... Uh, I, I, I don't know if this was, but I'm pretty sure most of those were, were Japanese exclusives. But I think we're going to slow things down just a touch, or at least mellow things out a little bit. Uh, am I right about that? Uh, mellow, but I would say still kind of intense. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, well, let's get into it. I, I've, oh, I had cool. L- there you're going with the ice puns again. <laughs> yep, that's really cool <laughs> because this is the um, the ice cave area. I saw it called a couple of different things, but um, what did you call this track when you when you brought it to me, Skeletor? Yeah, I know if this is a slippery slope. was Slippery Slope, also known as Ice Cave, from Euphoria, the saga, released in 1991 for the NES, once again by Sunsoft, composed by Naoki Kodaka. Uh, Skeletroy, I want to start with you this time. 
Why did you choose to play a song from this game, and why this song? Uh, a couple reasons, to be honest. So, uh, I, I don't know if you still have the YouTube tab open or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see that box art? I do. Uh, you see that ghost wearing the sunglasses? I do. Those sunglasses are, like, the meme sunglasses. This is where it comes from. Alright, Chukapow, you're the meme person. Do you recognize those? Uh... Uh, you wouldn't recognize the box art version, but if you look at the, the ghost sprite, yeah, it it's the sunglasses. Okay. Alright. Uh, but the other reason that I picked this was, like, it's, it's honestly just a really cool soundtrack. This is where Kadaka really started getting experimental with his sounds. For this one, he uh, he went around to everybody in the office and just went, What kind of music do you like? And people would respond, and he'd try and work that style into the soundtrack. So it like it, it's a real blending of, of styles. Definitely a departure from from like the his I guess metal roots and I I don't know maybe like this is where he kind of went oh well you know maybe I can do more than just this one thing um because again like this is his last NES soundtrack and uh yeah from there on he you know went to the Genesis went to the Saturn went to the Super Nintendo and realized that he had more musical possibilities open to him. You know, that's kind of why I I wanted to do this NES retrospective. Just to, to showcase where things sort of divided, I guess? With that perspective, yeah, this is a really, really great place to uh, sort of end the NES retrospective. And I did mention that we've got some bookends from different consoles, but yeah, perfect, perfect way to end things up. Shukapow, I did toss a, um, um, a screenshot of uh, Hebereke with the ghost with the sunglasses in there, so you can take a look. Those sunglasses do definitely look familiar to me now. <laughs> But that, that's a cool, uh, cool tidbit that you shared about how Kodaka came to this. I was actually, while I was listening, I thought, this sounds like a song. Like, this sounds like something that you would hear performed by uh, a modern rock or, um, like, maybe a slower metal track, like later Metallica type of stuff. It's, it's really, really good, and it goes from different places, and the... Um, Kodaka mentioned in that, that interview I referenced earlier that game music gave him a chance to write music for all sorts of genres, and he's very glad for the experience, and that he even got to work with international orchestras and musicians. Uh, he did do some real instrument work on the Saturn version of the, um, the Albert Odyssey game I mentioned. He said it's been a while since he did any game music, and I don't remember when this interview was from, but it, it's been a while since this interview, too. He said if he could work again with staff as passionate as he did back then, that he would love to write again. He also mentioned, I think this is interesting because we've touched on it a couple of times, he actually said in this interview that with the evolution of computers, game music has also evolved a great deal since his time at Sunsaw. He said, though sometimes I wonder to myself if amidst all this technological progression, game music hasn't lost that special something that lets you know game music is game music. Game music is a kind of music born from the unique media of video games. So I think you could find something in older Famicom music that you don't find in music for modern games. That special essence of game music and sounds. As you immerse yourself in these songs, hidden within the music, you can hear the souls and dreams of the many sound programmers who worked on them. And I love those words from this, this true master of his craft when he was uh, at Sunsoft on the NES. And I am really grateful and hopeful that someday we can hear the, um, the, the music of his protégés. I'm grateful that he is teaching and has been teaching now for years because he obviously has a lot of knowledge and experience to share. For sure. Jukaba, did you have anything that you wanted to say about this? Sorry, I saved you for last this time. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Uh, 
it was a uh, it was a fun track, but uh, I don't really have much to say. Okay. Well, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about this next one. We we don't play a whole lot of Game Boy on on the uh, the podcast, but when we do, it, it does tend to stand out some. There are some people who would say that the Game Boy actually was capable of more uh, audio wise than the NES was, but we can talk about that when we get back. Uh, Skeletroid, this is bringing us full circle in a couple of ways. Why don't you tell us about the game we're going to be, or the track we're going to be listening to next? Okay, so um, like I was saying earlier, I couldn't go with a whole block of Batman songs, so I uh, I just cut it down to two. And uh, yeah, this is uh, the ending theme from the Game Boy version of Batman the Video Game. That was the ending theme from Batman the Video Game, this time from the Game Boy version, released in 1990. And that is also the uh, ending of our Naoki Kodaka playlist, what I'm going to call Skeletroy Presents the 8-Bit Best of Sunsoft Sensation Naoki Kodaka. And I'm going to ignore the fact that the first track is actually (laughs) 16-bit. debatable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Shukapal, go ahead and start with you. What thoughts do you have about this little Game Boy tune? (laughs) That was very nice. I liked that a lot. Felt like an ending theme to me. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Like, I I could picture Batman perched next to a gargoyle on, like, a building corner overlooking Gotham City as an ending cutscene plays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the ending theme. It's the last song. Uh, it brings us full circle, Batman to Batman. It also is another non-NES track. What else was it about this particular track that made you want to want to show it to us on the show today? Uh, to be honest, I love this song because uh, it kind of bridges a gap. Because, like I was saying, all the rest of the Batman soundtracks came out in 89. Mm-hmm. Or all the uh, the Batman games came out in 89. This one came out in 1990. Kadako's working on this and Journey to Silius at the same time, and Ooh. it really shows. Yeah. Listen to the intro, like the first half of this song, and then go listen to the in- like the uh, cutscene intro of Journey to Silius. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Then listen to the second half of this song and listen to uh, stage two of Journey to Silius. <laughs> okay. It's like they're sister songs. Gotcha. Okay. Man, yeah, I was just going to talk about how how impressive it is that the different versions of Batman 
all have different soundtracks, except for the one cameo of Streets of Desolation in the, the Turbo 16 version. But I didn't even think about, yeah, this is really similar to, to elements of Journey to Silius. I do think we see here that Kudaka and his team were not as... Either the Game Boy just did not have the capability to reproduce percussion sounds that the NES did, or they just weren't quite sure how to get those sounds out of the Game Boy because they hadn't done as much work on it. Probably the first option. Uh, like, I, I played a lot of Game Boy. The drums were not there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever really heard much on the Game Boy drum-wise that, that's, that approaches anything that Konami or, or Sunsoft did on the NES, but there was an NES version, obviously. We, were, we played the Game Boy and the Turbo 16 version. Uh, there was a Genesis version of Batman the Video Game. Were those the only four? And an arcade version. Oh, okay. And Kodaka did the arcade version as well? I, I'm pretty sure he did. I'm going to do some, some live research here. Yeah, you might want to double-check that one so I don't come out as a liar. Because <laughs> I know the game came out the same year. And I would assume that Sunsoft would have the license for it, so I would just assume that he did the soundtrack, but now you got me second-guessing myself. All right, so yeah, I mean, obviously, he definitely did Genesis, NES, Game Boy... Definitely did the PC Engine version, as you said. Okay, so the Batman 1990 arcade game was actually not a Sunsoft joint. It was, uh... Oh, it's Atari! Jointly developed by Atari, Midway, Data East, and Namco. Oh, wow! Wow! Composer here is John Paul White, who I've never heard of before, but that's gonna, that's gonna bear some looking into. That's really interesting. I never would have thought that those four, like you're talking about Atari, of course, but then Midway, who eventually made Mortal Kombat, <laughs> Namco, who of course Yuka Pao knows about, and Data East, who are just legends in the arcade, um, arcade field. Man, I feel like this must have been quite a game, but I haven't heard that much about it. <laughs> okay, interesting. You got some. You all got some uh, real-time research there, but you know what? We've already said so much about Naoki Kodaka. I'm not sure how much else we have to add. Uh, hopefully, this playlist has validated our absolute love for <laughs> this man and his work. And if it wasn't obvious, I mean, we have to give shout outs to his team, specifically Nobuyuki Hara, who was so influential in, in the implementation of a lot of these things. But, ah, uh, man. Troy, thank you so much for, for joining us on this. Like you said, our mutual enthusiasm here really, I think, has elevated this episode. It's it's one of my favorites that we have done. By we, I mean me and Chukapau, not just you and me, because there haven't been as many of those. But <laughs> it's one, one of my, my favorite of these episodes. Chukapau, have you enjoyed this music tonight? Yep. This was a lot of good music. Right. It was a lot of very good music, you'd say. There we go. <laughs> I'm really glad that you were able to join us this time. And I'm also glad because I'm, I'm looking forward to some of our uh, some of our upcoming stuff. I think I'm ready to uh, spill the beans on some of this. I've already mentioned the uh, Alex Messenger episode where we're going to be talking Mick Gordon. Um, we are going to be also featuring some work, but some very specific work by the two titans of the industry, Nobuo Uematsu and Koji Kondo. So do look forward to what we're going to be doing there. Shukapau, are you ready yet to announce the uh, composer for the composer that you are picking for us to focus on in the one sort of opening that we have in the season? Or are you still thinking about it? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. Okay. All right, cool. Well, looking forward to it. And December is going to be a fantastic month for this podcast, so definitely look forward to it. Uh, December 4th, we're going to be doing Shukapau's Choice of Composers for the episode, so I know that's going to be fun. December 11th is going to be episode 11 of this season, and Shukapau, who always joins us for episode 11? Um, it's uh, Prof Jeff. Yeah, Prof Jeff's going to be coming to talk about one of all three of our favorite composers 
And that is Mr. Grant Kirkhope. Yeah. So that is when we're going to be featuring that. And then the next week on December 18th. Well, December 18th is going to be our season finale. And I'm not quite ready to reveal what that is yet. We will hype it up a little bit in the days and weeks leading up to it. Suffice it to say, I think it's going to be a very nice early Christmas present for all of you, and I am certainly looking forward to it. But you know what, Troy? Um, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me two weeks in a row. Peek behind the curtain. It's actually the same night. So for the second <laughs> time, you and I have recorded two episodes in one day. Um, this might just yeah, be we're our, good like that. our modus operandi. Yeah, your, your stamina is second to none, sir. So, well, Troy, anything else that you have got to, uh, to add um, to this whole thing? No, just go listen to Kadaka. If we haven't convinced you by now, I don't know what to tell you. His music's awesome. Seriously, everyone, it's worth just diving in for an afternoon and checking out all of these amazing soundtracks uh, in, in Toto. They're just so, so, so good. And Troy has done uh, covers of quite a few of these. Um, specifically, once again, I want to give a shout-out to his Jury to Silius covers. And, um, yeah, uh, Shukapau, do you have anything that you would like to um, to mention or to plug or to talk um, about? Follow me on flat.io at Lloyd Irvin for Smash. Or I will soon be composing Indecisive Battle from Final Fantasy Negative Are One. Are you going to change your name now that they've announced the last... No. <laughs> I'm not going to. You're the... I'm waiting for Smash 6. You're the second person to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but Chukapau is nothing if not persistent. Chukapau is still Lloyd Irving for Smash on Flat.io, and I do encourage everyone to go and check out those those compositions, because um, I really think it's about as good as anything you can do with just MIDI sounds. We are still planning to dig into FL Studio, but um, yeah, it's, it's good stuff, so go listen to it. <laughs> Alright, um, well, uh, shout out to our patrons you know who you are uh thank you once again for making last week's episode possible shout out once again to our artists uh naomi who did our fabulous cover art uh carlos who did the portraits that you see on our youtube video every week and ben the dyad dishman who did our pixel portraits which served as uh, the first faces of this podcast and are still featured in some of the art that you see online and thanks of course to our wonderful theme song guy skeletroy you're awesome, man. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, and we'll get you back next season for sure for something really fun. I think that's going to about do it. Shukapal, am I forgetting anything? Nope. All right. Oh, wait, Twitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely, I encourage everybody to reach out to us. Uh, you can interact with us on YouTube, which is where Skeletroy usually does. You can also come and join us on Discord. The link, as always, is in the show notes. You can interact with us on Twitter. Um, I post a lot, and I, I get likes, and I get shares, but I don't get a whole lot of comments. So if you're listening, um, comment on Twitter. Like some interaction there. And... Uh, yeah, that's at VGM Pod. You can also go and talk to Shukapal, um, at Shukapal. He doesn't get on as much as I do. I'm on there um, pretty frequently, multiple times a day. So if you reach out to me, you'll hear back from me that day. And um, yeah, I think that's going to about do it. So until next time, play very good games, be very good people, and keep listening to very good music. And I'm going to take some of a lot, a lot of what I just said and splice it into what we said, because that, that was actually gold and I, I didn't think about it, but let's go ahead and come back. <laughs> 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 You're getting stuffy. Um, I think it's uh, it's definitely pretty good. The um, remember to not click while you're talking, please. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting sauced by a bayonetta. <laughs> um. Well, it's 
that's kind of a like. A, bleh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it it's hard for me to formulate words when so many ideas are in my brain. Yeah, in that instance, this is a Renette with my words fail me. Oops. Fun fact, if you type in Stage 3 on YouTube and not anything else, the third video that pops up is Stage 3 from Batman on the NES. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, until next time... Play very good... Wait, it's, 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 it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not used to this part. <laughs> um. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. All that coffee's getting to me.